Alright, here we go. Special edition of Knicks Fan TV. Tonight's guest, he was the number eight pick of the New York Knicks in the 2005 NBA draft. Spent 15 seasons in the league, including winning a championship for the 2015-2016 Cleveland Cavaliers. Channing Fry in the building. Channing, how you feeling, man? man? I'm good, man. Listen, chilling. Uh, just got off another podcast with Jamal Crawford. All right. Uh, you know, keep in touch with Quentin Richardson. Nice. Obviously, I work with Zeke, all those guys down at NBA TV. So mm-hmm. it's pretty interesting. The Knicks thing is coming up a lot. Big time, big time. It always this time of year, right? This is the time of year when everybody wants to play for the Knicks. Everybody wants to come to the Knicks. Yeah, well, you know, listen, I think Knicks fans, and I'll say this, and that, you know, after, you know, thinking about this podcast, I think as somebody who grew up a Knicks fan, like my parents were Knicks fans, they're from New York, all that kind of stuff. Knicks fans need to be patient because – They've tried to buy wins through just getting talent there all of a sudden. It's not going to work like that anymore. So like with Thibodeau there, um, with the new guy, Scott Perry, who I I like a lot, Mm -hmm. uh, they have to be patient and see that development of their players within that system, right? And I think the Knicks over the last few years have not had, or the last couple of years, have not had player development, Yeah. right? I think that's the biggest problem is that you as Knicks fans – want to see player development every single year. Mm-hmm. Yes, put on a show. Yes, get wins when you're supposed to win, but make sure you get player development. I think sometimes the pressure of having to win now gets in the way of like the decisions that the upper management makes and who they bring in and why they bring them in. It's it's immense. It's immense, man. And, and as you said, the expectations are through the roof. But, you know, again, with all these names paired to the Knicks, now you have the Russell Westbrook rumors are starting to heat up. CP3 a little less, but, right. you know, what do you think about, you know, the Knicks going out and trying to acquire one of those two guys? Russell Westbrook, absolutely. Oh, 1,000%, okay. whatever you need, Russell Westbrook. I think, number one, he's going to give you a chance to win, which is going to hold the rest of your team accountable. He's not afraid to yell at guys or to say, you know what, F you, I'm going to do it myself, right? Right. Like, get his ass on the bench. Give me somebody who's going to help me do what I need to do for us to win. Um, I think he embodies New York style. Mm -hmm. It's like, if you ain't with me, me, fuck you type attitude, which I think is like everything that being a a dog. He's definitely a dog. He's a super dog. So he's going to go 110%, but he's also going to give you quality minutes, right? It's not like this fluffy, look at my box score. He's going to give you a chance to win every single night. Now, to build a culture back of the Knicks, you need that person. You haven't had that person. You've had a lot of talent, but never since Melo was in his prime, I think it was like 13, 14, right? When mm-hmm, JR mm-hmm. was popping, Shump, have you guys had somebody that gave you a chance to win every single night where everybody was getting quality, learned minutes each minute of the game. You know, on the flip side, when we talk about play development, we look at a right. guy like an R.J. Barrett who, right. you know, needs the ball, hasn't been shooting the ball well or didn't have a good rookie year in terms of shooting the ball. You have Westbrook, who's one of, you know, the highest usage players in the league. Right. How, do you, how do you think that squares up? Well, I think the thing is, is maybe you gave R.J. Barrett too much on his plate, right? Mm-hmm. Like, make it simple for him. And this, I'm, I'm old school in this thinking. R.J. Barrett is a very talented player. I think he's going to be very good. But you can't give him the whole plate of food. You're not going to give him the big piece of chicken. What has he earned? What has he earned? So all of a sudden, you're expecting him to give you 20 a night? It doesn't work that way. There's maybe a handful of guys that I can think that have taken that responsibility and and just skyrocket with it, right? And even in their first year, they were surrounded by culture and vets and stability and other talented guys that fit with them. RJ, if you, you know, obviously you watch the Knicks and I watch mm-hmm. him a lot. He was like, damn, I'm not going to get the ball. I got to shoot six times right. in a row, regardless of the score. How did, that doesn't make you a better player. And I think he's a winner. I think he has winning traits, right? Steve Nash is my, one of my good friends. He talks so highly of him. So I'm going on that and what I'm seeing. When things go bad, he wants to have a piece of the pie of like, how can we get this going? 
But by the end of the year, when things started getting bad, I saw him getting into bad habits. Mm. Now, Thibodeau is going to have them prepared. He's going to have them well-practiced. And they're not going to worry about being cool. Because sometimes, and, and it happened to us, I think, with the Knicks was New York is New York, right? So, mm -hmm. so I don't care what anybody says. If you never play for the Knicks, it's hard to understand. When you play for the Knicks, every door is open right? Mm -hmm. Every door in the city is open. Mm -hmm. You are like extremely well respected. You're part of the, the, the root of New fabric. York. Yep. The fabric, the mm -hmm. root, whatever it is. When you win, right? We were horrible teams. We won three or four in a row. You couldn't tell me nothing. You would have thought I won a championship. <laughs> but when we lost, everybody was so addicted to that feeling. They wanted to do their individual best more than what was best for the team, right? And I thought a team that should have stayed together if possible, Wilson Chandler, Gallinari, Amari, um, even, you know, Chubby Ray Felton, right? But, <laughs> yeah, but, yeah. but they were a team and they, they took those bright lights mm -hmm. and they said, hey, we need to work together. Um, and I'm forgetting somebody else, the kid from Stanford. You're on the um, Fields. Landry Fields. Yeah. But like that is what New York needs now in this generation is like, I can be that guy. I don't need to, you get one or two stars. They don't even have to be superstars. Rebuild your culture, rebuild the fabric of the Knicks. We need that. Right. Through, through saying, you know what? You're better than this guy, but this guy is better for us. Right. He fits us mm -hmm. for instance. And I'll use this and everyone will mm -hmm. San Antonio, Miami, Boston. They put players in their system that fit that system and the fabric of the city. Now, if you don't fit, they're like, hey, sorry, it didn't work out. Boom, bada bing, bada boom, we gotta go. Mm -hmm. Newton, the Knicks have to have that power again to be the powerhouse because I say this all the time, the Knicks being great changes the NBA. Oh, for sure. It yeah. changes, right? Brooklyn can be great and they will be great. Mm -hmm. It's not, it's, it's different the on the net. It's yeah. not the same. Yeah. It's absolutely not. And I don't care what anybody young head says, it's not the same. I played for it. I've seen it. The garden is the garden always. Uh, absolutely, man. And, and we're coming up on the eighth pick in this Wednesday's NBA draft. What do you remember about that night? You know, what did it mean to you uh, to be drafted by the Knicks? Your parents were Knicks fans coming up in okay. Bed-Stuy. And uh, my, my condolences to you on, on oh, their pass as well. That. So what did that mean to you to be drafted, you know, in front of your family for the, for their hometown man, team? Listen, I think growing up and, and hearing all the stories and uh, just being around the city, um, there's two halves, right? There's the, like, a little kid this is a dream come true. And then my stupid friends, Richard Jefferson and Luke Walt and Gilbert Arenas and all those guys from Arizona took me out two nights in a row in New York. Now I'm coming from college in Arizona and Tucson, things close at two. Mm -hmm. So like, right. I, like one night we were eating dinner till two. Right? So I'm like, guys, I got to get up at six. They're like, well, you, you better make, make sure your clothes is out. We're going to be out till five. Facts. I know if Gilbert hey, Arenas is out. there, he's with it. He's out. Oh, down. Because they're like, listen, Chen, you don't understand what this is about here. Like this is, we want to show you this. And, mm -hmm. and I was exhausted. With the eighth pick in the 2005 draft, the New York Knicks select Channing Fry from the University of Arizona. But it was like so much adrenaline. I was just like two hours of sleep and two days. And I'm like, is this going to happen? I thought I was going to get drafted by the Raptors. I ended up getting drafted by the Knicks. And at the time, Herb Williams was my coach. Mm -hmm. um, Isaiah Thomas to his day, I credit him. You know, I don't care what he, what business decisions he made. I understood what he was trying to do with those teams. Yeah, I it agree just didn't that. pan out. Yeah, it just didn't pan out. But like him as a human being, I'm riding with him all day. And it's mm -hmm. just like he, his loyalty to his people and to people who love him is so unwavering that it's 
something that I aspire to with, mm. with my friends, right? Mm -hmm. Like I could call Zeke at any moment and be like, hey, I need help, come get me whatever. Or hey, Zeke, like I need somebody to talk to. He's right there for you. And, mm -hmm. and, and so for me, being a part of this organization, at first him as a GM and then as a coach, mm -hmm. like that relationship was long lasting. Even when I got traded, he called me and was like, hey, we just traded you for Zach Randolph. Like he's a perennial all-star. I didn't want to let you go, but we need to win. And I was like, damn. And he goes, dude, you're going to love, Nate McMillan's going to give you the, you know, the, the discipline mm -hmm. and you're going to get a chance with this young team. And I wasn't even mad. I've been traded two or three times. I've been mad sometimes, <laughs> right? Yeah. But just about the process of it. But like that upfrontness, man to man shit that he was about, mm -hmm. it always gets my respect. Even now that I'm 37, this is 15 years ago. And, I, and to this day, I always tell him the man who gave me my chance, like, you know, it, it gave yeah. me the confidence of playing this league. Yeah, you know, to a man, you know, I've heard Q Rich on, on the Knuckleheads podcast say the same yeah, thing. Oh, yeah. Nate Robinson, uh, Eddie Curry, Jamal Crawford have all, you know, said the same thing about Isaiah. Because, you know, from a fan perspective growing up and you're reading the back pages and seeing all the turmoil and stuff, it's, oh. it's a very negative perception that you have. And, you know, the perception that MJ and the Dream Team had on him. So, you know, I, Isaiah's rep from the fan perspective was totally different. So it's very interesting to see from the player side of things, how you guys felt. I now, think, you had Larry Brown as a coach. Oh. And, and when Larry came I, in, I'm like, this is it. You know, we're about to start playing defense, championship pedigree, hometown guys. You know, we Let all pop my right glass now. here. Hold on. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Here we 23 go. 23 and 59, man. I mean, That's what was going on in there? And how are you processing this as a rookie? As a rookie, coming from Arizona, all I wanted to do is win. And I say this all the time, like, I didn't care if I go to Antarctica, Russia, Africa, Australia, just put me in a situation to win, give me my role, give me some stability, and I'm gonna go. Mm. We had the most starting lineups in the history of the, of the league, right? 40. 40, 40, 40. starting <laughs> lineups. I don't know if people understand that, so like, there were games where we didn't even know who was starting with 30 minutes left to go on the clock. Oh my God. I have never in the history of my 14, 15 year career been a part of a team so dysfunctional hmm. where he would tell me, I think I got a DMP my first game. He would tell me, Channing, you're doing great. You're going to get some minutes, blah, blah, blah. And then I'd be ready. And then I wouldn't play the whole game. <laughs> Like, I'm sorry, I forgot about you. <laughs> We're going with Jerome today. Right, oh, but but man. like if and, and now that I know coaches can say, hey Channing, this week, this is a lineup. We're gonna have to like you may get some minutes. Yeah. Okay, fine. I could do my workouts based on that. Mm -hmm. Communication was awful. Mm -hmm. Uh his we didn't have anything that was innately ours as a team. So we, he would start with plays one week, see other teams plays and then adjust those plays to them. Right. I remember I, I was, it started to be like a face up jump shooter, do my thing. Mm -hmm. I remember the day after I scored 30 on the number one pick, Andrew Bogan, who had a great career. Mm -hmm. Obviously I had a thing. Cause I was like, I should have been the number one pick. Right. You know, cocky little 22 year old. Yeah. I had 30 that day on um, jumpers. I was moving, I was shaking. Mm -hmm. And me and Steph had a good relationship, right? So Steph was balling that month. Balling that month. Steph was my guy. Steph, Stu, Steph, like, again, he's a person that, when you just talk about, like, his hoop knowledge, regardless of what you think of him, he's a baller. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Respect the baller Absolutely. and is, what are you just trying to make his own way, doing his own thing? Now, you may not agree with it all the time, but that's him 24-7. So it is what it is, and I respect that, right? Mm -hmm. And I could tell him, I don't fuck with that, or yes, I'm super down with that, mm -hmm. right? So the next practice, coach goes, Channing, you can't shoot any more jumpers. So I'm like, what? <laughs> Everyone on the team is like, don't listen to him. He's, yeah. he's, just, he's just saying it. He was like, no, no, no. If you shoot a jumper, you're going to go sit on the side. So obviously, we're running the plays that are meant for me to shoot. Mm -hmm. David Lee is guarding me. He backs up five feet. I dribble and kick the ball out. He goes, good job, son. 
My teammates are like, Jim, what the fuck are you doing? Shoot yeah. the ball. So all of a sudden, when you get a rookie where the game is already moving really fast, yeah. who's had some success with the things that he's worked on, have a coach absolutely T-bone that. I just went into a spiral of when to shoot, when not to shoot. And then he didn't play me. And then I didn't was getting DMPs. And then it was all over the place. And it was just like he did that with everybody. Jamal, mm -hmm. Nate, you know, Stephon Marbury. Mm -hmm. And like threw some of you guys under the bus. Dude, it was like he had a way he wanted to coach. And yet none of us were good enough for that way of coaching. Yeah. And I met a lot of coaches and off the court, I think he's a, a solid human being. Mm -hmm. But as a coach, I disagree with 99% of everything he said, right? We wouldn't even, when we would play back and forth, when we would have like pickup, he couldn't let us go down. We would have two hour film sessions. Right. He was, he would click. Like, so obviously we're losing a lot. Mm -hmm. Nobody wants to see four hours of us losing, right? Like, hey guys, like, Let's be positive. He was a gigantic dark cloud. Now, I don't know what's going on with him yeah. in his personal life. So this is not an attack on him as a person. This is my opinion on his coaching style. Mm -hmm. And I, in my 14 years, I think I played for 10 different coaches. So I've seen the gamut. I've seen it all. Yeah. And I, it's not like he's too strict. I played for Scott Skiles and I fuck with him mm -hmm. all day, every day. Mm -hmm. and he's a hard ass. Yeah, yeah. Like same sure. drill every day, close out, boom, boom, boom. Mm -hmm. I get it. I'm cool with that. I could do the work. I'm not afraid of the work. What makes me upset is he never gave us an opportunity as a team to be successful as a team. He never put somebody in their role as this is what you are. You're the top dog. You're the low dog. Yeah. Work your way up. If you can learn, earn, go. It was like, how can I just move and shake? Guys were starting. If you were from Phoenix, you could start that game. <laughs> He was going with sentiment some nights. That was a couple of the 40. He was like, uh, he's got yeah, more family in here. That's what was crazy about the whole situation. It was like, hold on. Like, this hey. guy hasn't played. We had G League guy. Ime Odoka came and played with us. Yeah. And he was starting when we played Portland. <laughs> like, he just came from the G League. Now, Ime can play. He was a G League MVP or whatever, D League MVP. So, okay, he could play a little bit. But he's not starting versus the Blazers. Come on. Coach Brown Come was on. losing it, man. That That's just surprising, man. You know, uh, a tenured, heralded coach like that. That's I tough. don't know what the conversations were between him and the upper management, but between him and any of the players, there's not one player on any of the teams that, or, or, or any player on the team that he coached that would vouch for him and say, he put us in a situation to win every single night, which is against everything that he did yeah. with AI in philly yeah. so i don't know what happened so you know and obviously he's not coaching now so it is what it is tough uh, that's tough man what what were some good days man you guys had some characters in the locker we had d lee you had nate steph jamal <laughs> Jalen rose was in there oh, like, what, man. what was your, your favorite so locker many, room story i mean to be honest i still to this day can text obviously jamal nate uh malik rose was a huge impact on like me being a pro um, uh, Eddie Curry, I love to see him when he got back in the league, you know, he struggled with some things. Um, Quentin Richardson, I work with him and me, I tell people the best part about the NBA is my relationships that I built with these guys. Mm -hmm. Um, we laugh about these things now. Um, obviously they weren't so laughable back then, <laughs> yeah. but like, <laughs> I've tried to learn from each one of those guys, a certain thing that wasn't innately part of me and um like jamal you know i'm a center mm. and i'm a system guy for the most part so me hooping during the summer is not something that i get looked forward to because guards just dribble the air out the ball mm. and then they shoot it and i gotta just run up and down but i was like jamal's been doing this for 20 years let me do this more q rich his chicago style physicality and his aggressiveness every single game and his willingness to push the limit to the point where you're ready to fight, I respect the shit out of that, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. Steph's approach to the game. And he's one of the top five guys that watch the most film I've ever had. And I played with Vince Carter, Braun, Brandon Roy, Steve Nash, Grant Hill. The list goes on. Amari, Kevin Love, whatever, whatever. Mm -hmm. 
his knowledge of the game was next level. I think Nate's enthusiasm, D Lee's uh, technicality of the game, where it was like, if I set the screen, I do this. And then, you know, just knowing his self, right? Knowing what people mm -hmm. thought he was going to do and then do differently um, was all things that I took. So that was my favorite part. Like, if I could do it all over again, I would, if I could win anywhere, I I love my ring and it stays above me all the time. Mm -hmm. Winning in New York, and I wish I could be in that locker room to tell these kids like, fuck your ego, fuck what you think your brand is. If you win, you are everything. Mm -hmm. If you win as a team, yeah, story. they don't care if you average two. They don't care if you average 20. If you win, you are part of the solution, right? That's the the thing that, you know, I, as my career went on, I kept trying to tell these kids. It's like, dude, you're trying to promote your brand. You're a loser. Right. And, and that's what I was going to say. Do you think it, it's, um, you know, with <coughs> take like Lamelo, for example, already has right. like a million followers and, and over time has built him up and you have right. the hyper media environment now with, with NBA totally. Twitter now and everybody's checking their highlights. You think it's it's harder for these kids now? To be humble? To Yeah, yeah, yeah to be humble. Yeah, I do. I absolutely do. Because at the end of the day, if they get 20 points, what are they looking at? Whether they win or lose, they're looking at how many people go, well, it wasn't your fault, mm. right? They're mm. being coddled. But at the end of the day, you're a loser. You either win or you lose. Now, sometimes if you lose to a better team, okay, yeah. shake your hand, go about your business. But when dudes are looking at Instagram talking about, well, it wasn't my fault, right? Because, mm. you know, I don't know how old you are. I don't know how old your listeners are. A lot of how I was raised was like at the park, right? So mm. my dad would drop me off. And I would play. And he'd be like, well, what's your record for today? And I'd be like, one and six. He'd be like, all right, so you got five down and backs. <laughs> for what? For those five for, L's, man. For those five L's. Yeah. You're a loser. <laughs> and he wouldn't call me by my name. He'd be like, hey, loser. Yeah. He would, And so I would be furious. Fur I'd be like, I, mean, I can't wait to go back next week. Mm -hmm. What do I need to do? Right? Mm -hmm. I don't, I'm not getting coddled by all this fake recognition and fake love, right? By social media. I, I'm internally upset that I did not do what was required of me to help my team win. And that is something that I've, maybe that's what makes me a good teammate. It's like, if I'm not good enough, my pride is to decide I'm gonna work. And then when you fuck up, they're gonna put me in and I'm gonna take your minutes. True. That's it. Yeah. So you better work. True. And it doesn't need to be pretty. You don't need to be this six move dude. You don't need to do that. You just need to do whatever it takes to win. What does it take to win? And what do you do as your skill set? Are you a rebounder? Rebound every ball. And then work on what everyone talks about later. If you said, hey, for us to win, I need to get 15 rebounds every night. Points are not important, but mm -hmm. I'm developing that. That is the thing what's hard. Everyone wants to be okay at everything. Be great at one thing and then work from that. And that's the work ethic I see in RJ Barrett, man. That's why I say, yeah. despite you know some of his struggles this this uh, past season, uh, I'm pretty confident that you know he's going to improve on that. But in this environment, I, I think you know those character uh, strengths, like you, you have to be mentally strong. Oh, you got to be mentally think, strong and humble, as you said. You know, you look at RJ, and I think he's going to benefit the most by far. And you know what? And I'm going to even say this: mm -hmm. I think Kevin Knox is going to benefit too because. From his rookie year, you go, here's what happens. Talent and expectations came quickly. Yeah, big time. And his went like this. Mm -hmm. He couldn't deal with it. He couldn't deal with somebody yeah, saying, yeah. that's not a good shot. Don't shoot that. Don't do this. And all of a sudden, he starts to think. Mm -hmm. What Thibodeau is going to do is going to say, this is the shots that are good. When you make these two out of three, three out of six, five out of seven, then you get more earn your way. Now, as a young man, when you earn your shots, you value them more, right? Mm -hmm. If your mom gives you a dollar and you're hungry, what do you get? You get the shit. You're going to get the biggest thing you can get for a dollar. Yeah. Then when you get $5, you go, you know what? I don't need to eat on all five. I could be, I could eat on one, this four, I'm going to develop this, mm -hmm. right? I mm -hmm. can make this stretch, mm -hmm. right? If once you give these young guys the table, they don't appreciate it. What is this? Oh, I'm getting 20 again. Uh, uh, <laughs> we're trying to win. Yeah. There's 100 shots in the game, and you just want to shoot 20? 
for what? More Instagram followers? Shoot 20 because that's what is required of your team to win. And that's what I think RJ Barrett can get. Thibodeau's going to, he's going to be tough on them in tough love. Mm -hmm. It's going to be hard. They're going to practice their ass off. But they're going to love that feeling of being prepared to win and expecting to win every single night. And from the first game, I bet you the first week or two, he's not going to like it too much. Mm -hmm. But after that, you're going to start to see both of them develop. And I think Kevin Knox is a great guy to come off the bench because I think personally he thinks so much about how can I score? How can I score? How can I score? They going to be like, if you're not guarding your dude, get your ass on the bench. Defense. It's got to be defense. He can guard. Think about this. If you're already a scorer and I found this, Mm -hmm. I'm not the best defender, but if I put energy and effort into my defensive strategy, if I can get one stop, I figure I'm up three nothing because I'm gonna make the shot. Mm-hmm. I'm gonna make my shot. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. So if I get a stop, I'm up three nothing. If I get two stops, I'm up six nothing. Six nothing coming off the bench. What does that do for a game? If we're down five, now we're up one. Damn, we need to keep chanting in the game. That's, true. That's another six minutes. That's what like That's knowing your role. That mentality, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's why I think he got to stop. You are, are you are so talented scoring, but like. You're so focused on scoring when somebody takes that away from you, when you can't do a 15 dribble move and pull up and shoot a bad two, you're gone. Lost. He's lost. Right. Because if he misses a shot and he knows his real role is to play defense, Mm -hmm. he goes, fuck it. And goes back and if I get a stop, I'm still in the game. Yeah, it's true. That's his where his mentality. That's where you're going to see him go from talent to, okay, he's a pro. Here's his position. This is how we can win with him on a court 24 to 30 minutes a game. I certainly hope so, man. Now, they have a new president in Leon Rose. Uh, right. Rob Palenka used to be your agent. He's now right. on the other side of the table. You have Bob Myers out in Golden State. Do you think there's like a – is there a common trait among, you know, the former player agent that makes them successful at this next level? I think it's just a, a understanding of players' mentalities hmm. and then understanding of GM's mentalities because they're the bridge between both, right? It, you think of like – I talk to Rob all the time about what I want. And then a GM and a president and owner talks to Rob about what they want. Mm -hmm. So his his wealth of knowledge is unique. And I think, here's the honest truth. If they allow Leon, Scott, all those guys, everyone that's there to do their job without interference, I think they'll be successful, personally. Do I think they need to revamp the, the team a little bit? Absolutely. Sure. Yeah. Definitely. I think mm-hmm. this is no knock against them. They are losers. Mm-hmm. You need more winners. You need more expectations, right? They need more small, like shrink it down to expand, right? Yeah. Shrink it down to expand. So shrink everyone's role so that they can expand it based on consistency, effort, and passion within the game, every single game. But I think what Leon Rose is going to do is make sure that they get the best deal possible so that they're not taking on crappy, you know. Yeah. Can't be a bailout, man. We got to win. We got to win these deals for sure. Got to win the deals, right? Win the deals. And my thing is you have Julius Randle, who I think is very good. But at the end of the day, he he hasn't played a meaningful basketball game in his career. Yeah. He gets mad buckets and mad points, but like, Can he play within a system that is successful? Right. As talented, as special as he is. That's why nobody talks about him. Yeah, that's true. As good as he is, as good as he is, people go, oh, he's just going to get his points. Yeah, he doesn't doesn't really make the team better. If he gets 20 and 12 and the team scores 80, every team in NBA scores above 100. So now we're still losing. (laughs) Still still losing. But if you said, hey, for us to win, we need those 12 always. We need that energy. But you're going to get between 18 and 24, right? But you need to be more efficient. And it needs to come within this system, right? That is when he's going to become special. Because I think, and I'm going to say this, he has all-star potential. Yeah. He's physical. He's quick. He's a freak. He's he's everything you a prototypical foreman in today's game. He can get you a triple-double. Can you win doing that maybe we don't need all that right 
everyone likes gummy bears. Mm -hmm. Everyone likes Reese's Pieces. Everyone likes M and M's. But you don't need all three of those things on ice cream. It, it's just not good. Maybe you just yeah. need Oreo yeah. cookies on it. That's what I'm saying. That's where I think everyone's role has to be shrunk, and they need to have a coming to Jesus. Do you want to win or do you want to get points? If you want to get points and, and get your stats, get the fuck up out of here. We're trying to win. It's just not going to work, man. And, and yeah, I, I agree with you, man. That's the most frustrating thing about Julius because you see the skill set there, but it's just crazy. It's just it is not crazy. winning plays, man. It's just not winning plays. It is. It's not my fault place. Mm. I, I'm trying. Look what I did. I have right. 20, 12, and 8. It's not me. But at the end of the day, the, he's half right. But yeah. what can you, instead of saying it's not me, to say, what do we need to do? But again, that comes from culture. It comes from consistency. That culture, yeah. comes, right. That's why Tibbs Establish is so important. That's why I felt like the Tibbs acquisition was so important. Well, they went full culture. Because yeah. he go, listen. <laughs> oh, you're gonna be some culture now. Let's <laughs> you're gonna be some culture. Them, them three hour practices, right? They're gonna get you right. Yeah, but yeah, everybody that, that I know that played for Thibs has said, I've never been more prepared mm -hmm. for a game as a as a professional than with him. Yeah. Now his relationships, that's what his assistant coach is for. That's what is gonna be interesting to see has he evolved. Right. Can he talk to these 20 year olds? Right. Right? Can he mm -hmm. like listen to you know the upper management and also his players and, and make that work? Yeah, yeah. With the pressure, with the pressure of New York. I agree, I totally agree. Now uh, you played 15 years in the league, ret been retired for a couple of years now. You know how did how did you reflect back on, on those 15 years? You know it started off a bit tumultuous, right? Uh, then you come into the heart ailment that was not only career threatening but life threatening. Right. Oh, bounce sure. back from that and then you know it's a it's an epic seven game finale and you finally uh, get that ring man how, how do you look back on your career i think for me i look back on my career as like the beginning half of my career up into my heart i tried to micromanage things i had no control over mm. and it made me it gave me bad anxiety mm. and then when a doctor tells you hey if you exercise you might die like shit comes very fast nice. at you. Yeah. Um, and after that, I worked out different. Like I approached the game different. Mm. Like I appreciated it more. Like this is a gift. This is a effing gift. Whether I'm in Boston getting booed, whether I'm sitting a bench, whether I'm starting, whether like basketball and I tell everyone this all the time now that I'm retired. Mm. Basketball is the most subconscious game of all time. And Knicks fans are some of the best at seeing it. If somebody doesn't dive on the floor, right? You know it, yeah, you see it, mm -hmm. but why didn't they dive? Is it not the most important thing in your life right now? Is, mm -hmm. is winning this game the, the not the most important thing on your mind right now? Because if it was, you would do whatever it took to win that. And that is what Knicks fans, old school Knicks fans are used to. Mm -hmm people going above and beyond what they're yeah. comfortable doing or what they expect themselves for the win, for their team, for their people, for the culture, right? Mm -hmm. And for me, during the course of my year, I tried to do that uh, every single game that I played after that. Now, it didn't always work out that way, but I learned a lot about myself. Um, and I, when I got the chance to win, I took advantage of my opportunities, obviously, you know, I didn't play that much in the finals, but that wasn't my role. Mm -hmm. Like, shit, I'm playing behind Kevin Love, Tristan, Richard Jefferson, and LeBron. Like, you still, you still dropped 27 in that run, though. So, I mean, you, right, you know, but, you, but you still put it work. Though. Everybody wants to be the hero all the time. It don't work like that. I, based on paychecks, for sure, it don't work like that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, what? Are you crazy? Yeah. They're not like, hey, Channing, come shoot this ball. <laughs> you we got 50, and LeBron got eight. Bron and Kyrie, Kate Kyrie, you get the ball after this. Yeah. But like I understood that. Mm -hmm. And it was amazing to be a part of that and to be a champion. Like played, you know, 12 years and I was a champion once. And then I'm going to the finals twice in my career. But all everything that I had learned throughout the course of the years came to that year, mm -hmm. those years um, of just being prepared, being humble, um, learning, and then being like, just like sit back. I would just sit back on a bench sometimes mm. and be like, 
guys, it's like, I have to remind guys sometimes, like, this is a game. This is like what we used to do in a park for Things free. Perspective. Yeah, yeah. But yet, what are you worried about? Mm. People's pride gets in the way. People's like, they're, oh, well, you know, coach doesn't play me. You suck today. <laughs> We're trying to win. What do what? Just keep what it a buck. <laughs> keep it a buck. Some days they'll be like, yeah, I don't know why I took you out, but guess what? You can ask him tomorrow. Have yeah. some nut. He's a man. You're a man. What's up? And at the end of the day, he goes, yeah, the matchup wasn't that good. I said, okay, okay. Mm-hmm. so now it wasn't you. It was them. Mm-hmm. They respect you enough to put their best defender on you. So instead of their best defender getting uh, uh, eight minutes rest, he only got four. So you don't understand that that helped us. The better you do, the better we do. And if you even if you come out and put our starters in, it's still helping us win. Like, see the bigger picture. It's hard for guys to see the bigger picture. You know, those Phoenix teams had some talent, obviously, led by right, Steve right. Nash, your Cleveland teams. Do you think that's what kind of separated them from – you know, your poor performing teams was that, you know, guys just knowing their roles and being able to execute uh, time. I think this, I think some people, when you have a team, you need to establish who's the engine and then who's the seatbelts, right? Like the seatbelts keep things together when shit goes wrong, right? Mm-hmm. The engine is what go- gets the car going. On bad teams, everybody thinks they're the engine, the steering wheel, the wheels. Yeah. And it's just like, listen, you just the radio, you the back speaker. That thing go <laughs> yeah. out. We still can listen. Yeah. We really don't need you. You are nice. You are good. You're a, you're an accessory, but you don't make this car go. Right. And I think on the best teams that I've had, even when we went to Western Conference Finals, I started half that year mm. between myself, Amari, uh, uh, Robin Lopez. Um, Coach came to us who goes, hey, Channing, you you and Robin are going to split time at center. Five, yeah. And him and I was like, all right, I'll go. But I, he goes, I'm going to tell you ahead of time based on your matchup so that you guys could be prepared. It wasn't 30, it wasn't he, 30 minutes before. Time. No, it wasn't 30 minutes. It was a week yeah, ahead of time. Yeah. He goes, look, Channing, you don't play too good against him, but you play good against him. Mm. Robin, you're going to start. You kill this guy. Channing, you're going to play here. Lou Amundsen. So me and yeah, when we used to play the old yeah. school mm-hmm. uh, Golden State, me and Robin would be like, this ain't us. They're playing all guards. Mm-hmm. So they would start Amari at the five, Lou Amundsen, Grant Hill, Jason Richardson, uh, Steve Nash. So that was our game where me and me and him were like, can they put a big man in or what? <laughs> so we get some minutes. But if not, Lou, let's go. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. And that is what I respected and loved about all the great teams. It's like they were like, Channing, when this guy goes in, you can go in. When he goes out, you go out. Mm. But like that's the best of the best teams. Now, not everybody has that situation, but like good teams have that culture to be like, you may not play today, but you're yeah. gonna play tomorrow. Who's gonna play is that starting five because those dudes can go and they are they are the engine of this car. Your position, you know, that hybrid four or five, when you came in with the Knicks. Um, right. You were still kind of playing back to the basket, but as you said, you could step it out. Also, in that time frame, you had guys like Yao Ming, you had Shaq, Dwight oh, yeah. Howard still playing back to the basket game. And nowadays, it seems like, you know, if, if guys can't play that role that, that you did or come out even further, you know, it seems like they don't even consider that back to the basket game solely. Well, I think the game has evolved, right? Because we have so many European players. Like, yeah. if you name yeah. other than Anthony Davis or JaVale McGee, Look at every starting center in the Western Conference. Sure. Porzingis, uh, big big fella Nurkic. from OKC, Nurkic, Jokic, Valanchunas from Memphis. Um, so that's what I mean. Like the European big man has taken over the NBA. Now they can shoot it, but like at the end of the day, most big men don't pass very well out of the post. It's not taught in America's game mm-hmm. where Jokic is dangerous. And that boy got that thing on a string. On a string. Woo, 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 woo. <laughs> yeah. he, he jumps this big, right? Like an nice. NBA 2K creative play. They were like 100 passing, <laughs> two athletic. Two, two lift. <laughs> two lift, right? But yeah, yeah. look at his impact on a game. He's Beast. a three skill player. Mm-hmm. Shoot, dribble, pass. And then at the end of the day, he's clutch, which people don't associate him with. I don't know why. And then on the block, he a problem. 
because you, number one, he's physical. He's 290. Mm -hmm. and you can't guard him. And he's patient, right? Because he can't, he got that old school, old man YMCA, yeah. loop the loop game. And if you double team him, bang, bang, now the shooters go. Done. Mm -hmm. but like for me, when I went to Phoenix from uh, Portland, the reason I started shooting that was because I was shooting bad twos, quote unquote. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. They go, Channing, take a step back. And I go, am I allowed to shoot these? And he was like, if you can make a thousand in five days, yeah, depending on your percentage. So I made like 92, you know, 920 out of a thousand. And they were like, yeah, you never, that's not your space. <laughs> And Steve watched film. He goes, listen, this is what you can do. Amari is too quick for a center. You shoot too well for a center. So they have to make a choice. Do they want to be in a screen and roll all the time? Or do they want to, you know, be, they can't get rebounds. They're not getting shot blocks. And at the end of the day, you play very good defense on big centers, right? But when I was in the league, the center was way big. Like I remember I had to guard Shaq one time. <laughs> and this fool, listen, look. I was only 220. That boy, listen, he yeah, I told him. And he goes, you know, I had to fuck you up, right? And I was like, I see that. Barbecue me in the chicken. Barbecue. Boom. Ooh. I said, yeah. Like, there was nothing I could do, but he was the most dominant player I may have ever played against, right? And it was just yeah. like, he's so big. But I knew I couldn't guard that, but I had to practice all the time. Mm. Like, I remember when I was in Portland, I was guarding LaMarcus Aldridge every single day. Mm -hmm. He is a true back to the back yeah. center forward. And he's, I mean, he's a walking bucket. Mm -hmm. But like, it helped me so much when I had to guard other centers because of his tendencies, because of what he was doing. So it was, uh, it, it helped me. But yeah, I mean, it was different when I started shooting threes and everyone else start shooting them then you know listen that's when the career went trends trend said it man it's all good um now on this show since his untimely passing you know most of my guests that have had interactions with kobe i always ask him to, to share their favorite story uh you played for the lakers he wasn't there on the team but you played for no, the lakers no, no. you also shared the same agent in, in rob palenka what, what was your favorite uh kobe story um when i was a rookie kobe i went up to the i was at the all-star um, I was, you know, the, the rookie sophomore game mm. and Rob was like, Hey, come up. Kobe wants to talk to you. So Kobe and I talked for like 30 minutes. Um, and he was like, man, just continue working. Like you're, you're badass, blah, blah, blah. And, you know, he said, Hey, just come to dinner with us. And I didn't have nobody to go to dinner with, whatever it was. Mm. So I go to dinner with him and he's there with his security. And I remember it ended up getting on a conversation that he knew the TV shows that I watched. <laughs> And I don't know if he got that from my agent, yeah. but like we started talking about the TV shows that I watched and like the cartoons and the comic books and like the lore behind that. Um, and him and I got into like a deep, like a deep, like, I don't want to say a religious discussion mm -hmm. about those ideologies. Mm -hmm. And I was like, I walked away from that was like, how the fuck did this <laughs> not, you know? It's like Professor X. Right, he professed the shit out of me. And I'm like, <laughs> damn. But like, after that, it was always respect. And one time we were playing and Kobe was getting into somebody. And I was like, man, shut the fuck up, Kobe. <laughs> and he looked at me and goes, that better not be Chetty Fry. I said, it's me, you motherfucker. <laughs> because me, like, I'm super happy-go-lucky. Yeah. But I do have a button. Like, if I like you, I'll joke with you like that. Mm -hmm. But like, I think he saw me go like, you know, blackout crazy. And he was just like, hey, Chan, you better come down. Like, I'll foul you out this game. And then I came back to Jesus was like, ah, shit. Yeah, I do want to play. Mama like, talks. Gotta, you got to listen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Listen, look, he said something to me. I was like, you know what? OK, I'm going to go ahead and chill it out. Come get him. Jay Rich, go guard his ass. Yeah, I'll be cool. I'll be no over switch. here. I'm no chilling. Switch. Yeah, yeah, no switch. <laughs> rest in peace to Cole, man. Rest, rest in peace to the back. Mamba. Um, now, see your wine glass there. Is, is that from the vineyard? Is that chosen family? Yeah, that's my wine. These are my wine bottles up here. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so that's my new new venture. This is our Chardonnay. Okay. Um, the big thing, or the, I'll just give you the quick elevator spiel here. Yeah. I think wine, like I've never seen anybody get aggressive over wine. Yeah, right? that's like, true. It's true. Certain alcohols make you aggressive and yeah. like, 
the best conversations I've had with men and women have been over wine, over a good meal. Mm -hmm. And they give us an informed, important, educated opinion on whatever we're talking about. Mm -hmm. Those type of conversations make me better as a person. And so it just like got me hooked on wine and what it can do for people. And not that you have to drink it every night, obviously that's too much. But for me to be in this game as a young under 40 black man, to be doing a 100% e-commerce brand, um, we don't have a tasting room obviously because of Corona and all that kind of stuff. But for me to have my foot in the door um, through a passion, um, through what it's done for me when it's uh, come to, um, excuse me, to my teammates, to my family. I've learned so much, like from some amazing people sitting over dinner, something that was supposed to be an hour turns into four hours, yeah, yeah. whether it was yeah. like, you know, this is a place out here, Domain Roy. Mm -hmm. um, so like somebody would go, man, I remember I went to Oregon and I was meeting with Nike and they were talking about these shoes and all of a sudden the conversation goes into the culture of sneakers you know, then it goes into, you know, the, the Black Lives Matter movement, and then it just evolves. But at the mm -hmm. end of it, you're like, I'm better, right? Like, yeah, I'm growth. better. Yeah, yeah. Growth mm -hmm. is like what you need. And it's not divisive. If you say you don't like it, okay, you don't right. like it. Right. Not me. Nowadays, it's like between coronavirus, the presidency, mm -hmm. what's going on with America, everything is divisive. Sure, yeah. Everything sure, is not your religion. Yeah, yeah. How do you, you have to grow as a person. Mm -hmm. Your way of thinking today cannot be what it is tomorrow or else you're, you're already two steps behind. And so to get back to wine, it's just like, it's been so, for me, it's been so inclusive. It's been so amazing to start my own small business, uh, to work with friends that I love and to have the opportunity to make something that is high quality. It's not bullshit. It is super high quality. And I'm able to work with people that other people may not be able to, uh, to use my platform because these winemakers are doing amazing things. Mm -hmm. um, and if we can, if I can encourage one little black kid, one little minority to say, damn, like I want to learn about wine, not necessarily the drinking part, but like the whole Business. farming part, the yeah. industry, we're, we're making it better because your perspective is important, right? How you grew up is going to change how you taste this wine mm -hmm. and how it can be better. So, yeah, that's, no, that, I, that's excellent, man. Excellent and inspiring. And as you say, you know, we, we've lost that ability to reason with, with yeah. one another, you know, respectfully, everybody's just right. on, on a short fuse, but, uh, you know, something <laughs> like wine could be a happy medium, man, you know? Exactly. I, like, think about it, like watching a movie, you know, having yeah. a nice meal. You're like, you know what? You deserve this. Right. How many times do we do things in service of others? Mm -hmm. Right. It's like when somebody nice comes over, if you got a girl, what you do? Girl, I'm gonna get you a nice bottle of wine. <laughs> oh, thank <Yeah>. you. <laughs> if your boy comes over, he's going through something, right? You're like, hey, yeah. let me get you a nice bottle of wine. Let's chop it up. Let's watch some sports and you feel better. It's a it's a term of endearment. It's a mm -hmm. it's a thing of like giving. And that's what also is amazing about it. It's like when I love somebody. I want to give them a bottle that shows my appreciation for them mm -hmm. by how much I know them. Yeah, that's dope, man. So looks like retirement is certainly treating you well. The, the media it's game going. is also keeping you busy. You know, you got yeah, yeah. TNT shows, uh, Blazes Ed podcast. So yeah. seems like you, you enjoyed retirement life, man. You don't miss the game. Yeah. No, I, I think I had to stay with basketball, man. You know, I love talking. I love doing this stuff all the time. Um, you know, for me, I feel like NBA TV, the culture of that place was me. Yeah um who i am what i'm about um just with being able to to talk to gary payton and Shaq and charles and vince and and steve smith and isaiah and q rich and everybody that comes on um i've learned a lot taking different perspectives but i think for me i want to always bring my attitude and my like persona to it by saying like i hope every player when i criticize them it's not them as a person mm -hmm. or an organization it is my knowledge of knowing what works to right. win. And so it's not you, it is what you're doing out there, which can be changed. Night in and night out, that can change. So what I say about you on Monday can completely change on Wednesday, can completely change on Friday. I only talk about what I see. So I feel like that type of attitude has helped me in this business and hopefully I'm here for a long time. 
Hey, 15 years in the game, a championship, you know, your opinion should be re- respected. Um, last question, as I said, as we segue into the draft, you know, you went to University of Arizona. Growing right. up, those teams, they had ballers, man. They had yourself, right, right. they had RJ, Gilbert Arenas, you know, Mike Bibby, Miles sure. Simon. The list goes on. Who, who's your starting five? Who's your all-time Arizona starting five, man? Me at the, fi- me at the five. <laughs> right. Automatic. Of course, of course, yeah. Automatic. Yeah, no doubt. I'm going Mike Bibby at the one. Okay. So you so you going Bibby over Salim? Salim was nice. Yeah, Salim's more of a two, by the way. Oh, yeah. But I, right. Yeah, that's true. That's true. I'm going to go with Salim. Okay. As the two. As the two. Okay. It's hard for me to do that. Yeah. Over Jason Terry, Damon Stoudemire, Mike Dickerson. and But I'm going with more of my guys, right? Okay. So All right. Salim or Mike Bibby, Salim, Andre. Okay. And then. Okay. The four is hard. How are you going there, man? Hey, Derek, I might Derek, go. Derek, Derek I might move me to here. the four. Okay. But you going Lauren Woods? I might go DeAndre Aiden. Ooh, a recent one. A recent one. Yeah, I'll go DeAndre Aiden. That's I think a middle all squad, man. Bibby, yeah, Salim, Stoudemire, baller. Iggy, Channing Fry, DeAndre Aiden. Yeah, and, and I'm missing. Obviously, I'm missing. Miles Simon, yeah. Steve Kerr, Richard yeah. Jefferson, Gilbert. Damn, yeah. I put Gilbert. Yeah, but Hibachi, man. Anyway, yeah, I mean, I'm, list, I'm going with my guys. I'm yeah. going with my guys. I, uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's dope, go, man. Too well, much. well, listen, Chan, I, I definitely appreciate you giving me the time, of course, man. Of course, and, uh, it's great. Hope you join us another time. Let's do it like a wine tasting or something next, sure. next episode. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, when the season comes around, well, I'm for sure going to do this again. Let's do it again. Channing Fry, thanks yeah. again, bro. Thank you, man. All right, man. Enjoy the weekend. Yeah, yeah. I would say 60% positive reception for Channing Fry out of Arizona. Fry knocks it in. Oh, nice pick and roll to the floor. Blocked by Channing Fry. Excellent help defense for his second. Able to help break that play up. Robinson, nice pass to Marbury to Channing Fry. Nate Robinson made that entire play happen with his. Crawford, double team, Crawford over to Fry, Fry the jumper, it's good!